Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Dr. Shana Keller, and this week I'm doing a reaction to the Medscape article that was published in October of 2023 this year. Um, PCPs, primary care physicians, being penalized for positive outcomes using lifestyle medi lifestyle uh, changes. So let's. I'm going to go through a little outline, and then I'm going to talk more deeply about a couple different topics. So I'm going to talk about what lifestyle medicine even is, and why we use those terms to describe lifestyle changes, uh, healthcare practitioner versus provider, and some history around those words and why they matter. Chronic illness. How much chronic illness do we see in the United States? Kind of get some stats. Let's talk about it a little bit. And the CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. That's what CMS stands for and standards of care, aka flow chart medicine. All right, so let's jump in. Let's start with the article itself. It's written by medical doctor, Dr. Patel. Some of the comments, if you guys ever are curious to, um, to learn about some of the medical doctors or doctor struggles, the comments can be really uh, interesting place to look. Um, several of the practitioners that commented on the Medscape article, let's back up, Medscape is news for medical professionals. And so I subscribe to it. I've been a subscriber since my like second year of naturopathic medical school. I don't agree with a lot of the things they say, but as a person that spends a lot of time on the foundations for health, aka lifestyle medicine, um, this is something that like stuck out to me and I took the time to read it and go through and look at some of the comments. What's really the thing that stood out the most to me in the comments is doctors that had been in per practice for 20, 30 years are like, hey, medicine has changed. It used to be the doctor patient like uh, relationship. And now it's the doctor insurance patient relationship, the insurance company kind of being the middleman and shoving themselves in the middle there saying, hey, doctor, you don't actually get to do the things that you need to have the doctor patient relationship. You have on average, I was just doing some research for our lobbying efforts here in Colorado for my profession. Um, on average, the a uh, average primary care appointment is 18 minutes. Um, the lowest is 14 minutes. Now, my question would be is, is that face to face with the doctor themselves? Or is that with the MA or the PA, like kind of parsing that out? And I didn't really find more detailed um, data. But regardless, let's just go with the average 18 minutes. How in 18 minutes can a doctor do the, um, this was crazy, 2,500 2,500 requirements, like uh, uh, measurable outcomes that CMS is making doctors that take Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid is for people under the age of 65, low-income families, and then Medicare is people over the age of 65. And there's various flavors of both of those types of insurance. Basically, they're government funded. And I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that. There's a time and a place. My family, being low-income family, we used Medicaid for a long time. Um, and when the Affordable Health Care Act got approved when I was in my early 20s, I was then able to be covered under insurance when I had been uninsured for four years. So I'm not poo-pooing it. I think we need some socialized, social support for families that are struggling. Um, and, you know, our seniors. Our seniors kind of get shoved in a corner. Now, here's my struggle that I have with CMS, especially when I've seen my elderly patients. We have elderly put on a variety of medications, let's just say on average 10 meds. Some of those medications don't have the benefit for our older patients that they do for our younger patients that may or may not need or meet the requirements to give that prescription. Um, some of them have adverse side effects, things I think about are statins and sometimes high blood pressure medication. If I have a patient that's coming to me with 150 over 80 blood pressure and they're 79, would them taking a blood pressure lowering medication actually be more beneficial than them just having 150 over 80 blood pressure? That's a conversation to have to have with the patient instead of just saying, oh, CMS says that's the box to check. Great. Here's your prescription. I'm not even going to look up for my notepad and I'm just going to like, you know, check, check the box and get out the door. And I know a lot of you are going to resonate with that. I haven't seen a medical doctor since I was 20 because of my last experience I had. Now, I'm hoping to have a medical doctor on my podcast soon um, who's local to my area here in Montrose um, who's stepped out of the system. And when I say step out of the system does not mean that we're not still participating with the system because I don't take insurance either, but we still play the game of like how do we get our patients the best support and care that they can, you know, without burning ourselves out. Okay, so so the main problem with this or the main problem that Dr. Patel provides us with um, in this Medscape article is the five-star rating system 
that CMS uses to give uh, healthcare professionals. Um, and you know what? The main outcome it's based on is medication adherence. So what that means is, is if you recommend someone that has type 2 diabetes and the American Diabetes Association, the ADA, actually says, hey, the first the first line of treatment for someone with type 2 diabetes is lifestyle modification, diet change, educa- uh, exercise, etc. Most people know this. They just need the accountability. But if if I were a medical doctor who was a family physician and I prescribed my patient to eat a high protein diet and make sure they're getting a 30 minute walk in after or, you know, a 10, 15 minute walk in after their meals twice a day, I could then get penalized when that patient no longer needs metformin. What I mean by that penalization is uh, my my five star rating that I've had in the 20 years I've been in business and I'm like making up a story here now went down to three stars. And so when you read the comments, you can see other medical professionals that have had this happen to them that accept Medicaid and Medicare. So so when organizations make that recommendation that lifestyle changes are the most important thing, the first order of business, but then they're getting in trouble for making those recommendations in their 18 minutes that they're spending with their patients, as a professional that would be handcuffed to that, um, I would be losing out on income. And by the way, 50% of fees that go towards your insurance company go towards the insurance company, not doctors. So the insurance companies are making bank and everyone, the patients and the doctors and other medical professionals are suffering, not the insurance companies. They've inserted themselves in in a very good way that makes them benefit the most with having to do less work. And these are people that don't go to medical school of any flavor and they dictate what the medical professionals can and cannot do. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to dis, I'm going to go, I'm going to jump on my outline. So let's talk about standards of care. And the question I asked as a naturopathic doctor when I was a student was whose standards of care? This is the insurance company's standards of care, the conventional allopathic medical system standard of care. Does that mean there's not a place for them? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I'm just asking the question, whose standards of care? Flowchart medicine is what this is. So you come in, you walk into a doctor's office and you have constipation. All right. You know, in their 18 minutes, they t- chat with you. They ask you their their questions. Have you, Are you smoking cigarettes? You know, we've checked your medications. We've checked your allergies. We've checked your, um, you know, your new diagnoses. We've made sure of all these things. We spent all this time on all this junk and we have like three minutes now to talk about constipation. There are many root causes of constipation and Miralax deficiency is not it. <laughs> Miralax could be a thing to prescribe, preferably not to children under age six, which it says on the bottle, but I've seen kids under the age of six that are prescribed that long term for pediatric constipation. So what are some other causes of constipation that in a three minute time window after all the measurable outcomes that CMS requires medical professionals to ask their patients in 18 minutes? Thyroid, bowel obstruction, colon cancer, hemorrhoid pain, disordered eating. Like those are just a handful of the potential causes that could be going on. The person might not be drinking enough water. The person might not be eating enough. Like literally not eating enough can cause constipation. And in kiddos, um, bowel holding, I'm too scared. I, you know, it's kind of scary to like take a piece of yourself and like get rid of it, especially with little boys. It tends to be more common. I don't know why that is, but that's just what I see clinically. Flowchart medicine doesn't allow there to be this space. There's just like, okay, you have constipation. Instead of that being a symptom, now that's a diagnosis. Patients diagnosed with constipation. That's a symptom. I would even go as far as to say something like an autoimmune condition is a symptom of a dysregulated immune system, but that's me using my naturopathic thinking as opposed to the conventional medical system process of thinking. Okay, so the CMS, medical grading, um, is based on medicine adherence. So keeping that person in the system on that medication so that they get the care that they need. And usually when they're on mound medication, they will end up on a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. As one of my mentors, Dr. Christy Fleetwood, who is a registered pharmacist and has been for over 30 years, um, I think it was maybe like 12 or 15 years into her pharmacist career, she started seeing patterns. And she's like, what is going on here? I have a patient coming in with cholesterol issues, and then all of a sudden they have diabetes type 2, and then all of a sudden they have high blood pressure. And they're on these, you know, cocktail of three different medications for metabolic Uh, syndrome. Um, What's happening here? They're just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. You would think that the medication is helping them get better. 
So she became a naturopathic doctor and she is someone I keep in my back pocket when I have questions about medications because she knows them really, really well. Um, and she has fabulous results with her patients as a naturopathic um, doctor. So I'm not worried professionally about my job becoming obsolete with robots taking over, but doctors that, you know, are in this flow chart medicine, I'm being a jerk here calling it flow chart medicine, but it really is like you go to up to date, you go to Dynamed, there's a flow chart, you have constipation. Is this the, is this what's happening or is this what's happening? Okay, great. Is this what's happening or is this what's happening? This is the medication that you do. And if that medication doesn't work, then you try this and then you do this procedure if none of the above work. So it's very much based on procedures and medication. There's very little off, very, off, uh, very few times is there actually lifestyle recommendations being made in those flow charts. Doesn't matter if the ADA makes those recommendations or not. Okay. So standards of care always ask the question, whose standards of care? Now, if I break my arm and my bone is sticking out, please God, let the doctor follow the standard of care, but also have them use their surgical mind to be able to put the bone back in place because the thing in the textbook doesn't always show up in a clinical setting. We got to keep that in mind too. So let's just, dis- let's define lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine or foundations for health is what I refer to them are, is let's address your nutrition. Let's address your hydration. Let's address your sleep. Let's address your exercise and movement. Let's address your community. Because if you're surrounded by a bunch of assholes, it's going to be really hard for you to overcome your anxiety and depression. Guarantee it. Um, So going from the approach of these five pillars of health, if a person has type 2 diabetes, which I have treated several cases now where we've just done lifestyle intervention and maybe we'll throw in some herbs for some sexy goodness because everybody loves a little, you know, something, oh, what is the naturopathic doctor going to add to this? Um, when we address the pillars, we see some really big things happen. When I was a student, Dr. Fleetwood, I um, referred a patient to her because it was a friend, family friend of mine and I wanted to make sure she got good care from a vitalistic naturopathic doctor. And so I got to sit in on the phone calls. This patient had an A1C, a hemoglobin A1C, which is a blood sugar marker um, of 14. And her fasting blood sugar was sitting at almost 400. She had no symptoms. So one of the things that's important with type 2 diabetes is that we make sure that end organ symptoms such as, you know, blurred vision, kidney issues are not a problem because then we talk about organ destruction, eye, uh, loss of eyesight, kidney failure. We don't want that. She was having no symptoms of those. Within six months, her A1C is down in the like eight range, which is fantastic. Um, she was taking a medication, which after that six month period, she was she came off that medication. Um, Dr. Fleetwood's thing is always get your patients so stinking healthy they don't they're over medicated. And symptom, symptoms of over medication are um, for type two diabetes is low blood sugars. Um, and after a year of the patient changing her diet and adding in exercise. Her blood sugar was sitting at 120, and this is an older older patient. She's in her 70s, so we have to keep in mind age and you know the the risk and the benefit. 120 average fasting blood sugar is still pre-diabetic. However, for someone in their 70s, that's really good. And to go her A1C, what did it drop to? Like five point something. I I forget. But she was in the pre-diabetic range in a year. That's really impressive. With basic diet and lifestyle recommendations. And she was like gung-ho about it. She did not want to be on the medication and be beholden to it. Nutritional deficiencies such as chromium and vanadium also played a role in benefiting this this particular patient. So there's this whole like fancy niche um, that you can get board certified as a lifestyle medicine or preventative medicine specialist. It's kind of funny as an naturopathic doctor to see like preventative cardiology like be making the rounds when I feel like that's literally what naturopathic doctors do. So I'm glad that conventional allopathic docs are hopping on board with this. 80% of chronic illnesses, 80% of them are lifestyle induced, i.e. preventable. Uh, Lifestyle induced meaning the food we eat, the alcohol we consume. Alcohol is a big, big, big contributing factor to elevated cholesterol and people don't like when they hear that. Yeah, but alcohol, yeah, but wine has all these benefits. No, alcohol is not beneficial to us, except it takes the edge off and makes us feel a little bit better, but it doesn't actually have any health benefits at all. (laughs) Have some grapes, (laughs) have some pomegranate juice. I don't know. Alcohol is not not the solution. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk about so we talked about chronic illness and 80% of chronic illnesses. Oh, let's talk about this piece too. 
The United States spends more money than any other country in the world on health care. And yet we're the sickest country in the world. We have the highest uh, maternal mortality rates in the world. Yes, higher than impoverished countries that don't have access to health care. Isn't that weird? I think that's pretty weird. Um, and that's worse if you are black or Hispanic uh, mother. So, you know, when when families decide that they want to do a home birth as opposed to a hospital birth and they start learning the statistics on home births and the safety and the less medicalization that tends to happen when um, mom decides to have a home birth. People are always shocked because they think home birth is inherently associated with death and destruction. Um, you know, we think of people in huts with dirt floors with poop everywhere. Like, I don't know, this is the image that I've heard some people talk about. It's like, no, you don't have to be in a sterile hospital. Hospitals are for sick people, not for newborn babies in my mind. Now, there's a time and a place. I'm really glad there are hospitals because I've had a couple friends recently that had preeclampsia. And if it wasn't for modern medicine, both of them could have been dead. So I am grateful and I'm happy that we have access to modern medicine. But I'm just saying, isn't it weird that in the good old United States of America, where we spend so much freaking money on health care, we can't even keep moms alive after they have babies. And we are the highest highest mortality rate in the in the world for it that's bizarre to me and like something doesn't compute like more medication more procedures more medical intervention does not mean better outcomes um all right so healthcare practitioner versus healthcare provider so the term healthcare provider um i will post in the show notes a uh 2021 journal article that i pulled up um about this term. And I first learned about this word being a problem in medicine from a fabulous medical doctor, Pamela Weibel, whose main focus, she runs a suicide hotline for healthcare professionals that are really struggling. Um, if you're not familiar with her work, she has a TED talk. She's written a couple books that are really fun. And um, she does uh, business retreats for healthcare professionals to help them build their dream clinics. And she does, when she was still doing uh, family medicine, she was taking insurance, but she made it her own. So don't feel like you're stuck and beholden to the system just because you want to take insurance and be able to help patients that just don't have the uh, disposable income, right? There's always uh, there's always a way around things. Like if you feel like you have a gun to your head, call Pamela Weibel. She will help you get oriented to the place you need to go. It doesn't matter if you're a specialist. It doesn't matter if you're a family practice doc. It doesn't matter if you're a PA, a nurse practitioner, a registered nurse, an naturopathic doctor. Like she will get you. She's magic. She's a magical human. She also is of Jewish descent. So provider was used during Nazi Germany to be demean Jewish healthcare professionals. Um, and in the article I'll post, it kind of goes into more detail on like how they use that word. Uh, what's interesting to me is like how many times a day, this word never sat well with me as a student. I was always like provider, provider of what? I'm a provider of what? Like, am I just am I just participating in this consumeristic world? Like thinking about this more philosophically? It never sat right with me, even though I didn't know the history of this word. So when I heard this history, I was like, I'm a healthcare practitioner. That way I'm being inclusive of the PAs, the MAs, the nurse practitioners, the doctors, the, the NDs, the variety of flavors of healthcare professionals there are, um, as opposed to using this word provider. So doctor in Latin is docere. Docere means to teach. This is one of the principles of naturopathic medicine, which is why I spend 90 minutes with my first first patients. I spend 45 minutes collecting history, doing a physical exam and some functional tests right there in office. And I spend the other half of my visit educating, getting them oriented oriented to the paradigm of your body can heal. We just need to give it the three things it needs. Help the body take out the trash, give the body what it needs and get out of the way. That's my brain. That's your brain. Most of the time we're overthinking and trying to like think and grasp and hold on. Why am I constipated? Why am I constipated? Get your head out of your ass. Let your body do its job. Like I know that sounds simpler than it can be, but it is a thing that I see regularly. And I've experienced this too. Like when you just are thinking, thinking, thinking so intensely about a situation, it's hard to let go and like step back. Can you be the objective observer and allow the beauty of our body to heal? 
you cut your finger, you don't have to think about the finger healing unless it's a really bad heel and then you have to go get stitches, right? Like a really bad cut and then you have to go get stitches. Generally, the body heals itself. You don't, maybe you wash it out, but that's all you have to do. You don't have to add Neosporin. You don't have to add Poplar Bud Salve. Although I'm an advocate for doing Poplar Bud Salve over Neosporin because Neosporin breeds antibiotic resistance. Anyway, I digress. So if doctor means to be a teacher, how are we able, how are we as family healthcare professionals able to teach our patients in 18 minutes when CMS is making a, making insurance carriers of Medicaid and Medicare check all these freaking boxes? It takes away from the patient-doctor relationship. So I bring this up not to just say there's all these problems and there's these flaws and everybody knows there's flaws with the system. We spend the most on healthcare in the world. And our healthcare outcomes are garbage. Perhaps over managing, so maybe the getting out of the way isn't just the doctor and the patient, it's also the insurance companies. They need to get the heck out of the way and let the doctor be a freaking doctor and make a decision and help their patients get well. And you know what? Maybe they're not open to lifestyle modifications and they're not interested in hearing that because. You know, maybe it's a single parent that's working three jobs and has three kids at home and needs to, you know, they just don't have the capacity. Okay, fine. We will medicate. And in that medication, you will then experience symptom relief so that hopefully at some point we can have this conversation again. And, you know, being raised by a single single parent, it's tough. And I get that it's tough. And I know that not everybody has the capacity to, you know, make sure they're getting enough protein and make sure they're getting enough vegetables and make sure they're getting a walk-in and drinking enough water. But if we can't take care of ourselves, we can't prioritize ourselves. you know, this is a hard conversation to have with some of my, my clientele. It's like, if you're not on number one on your priority list and you die, all the other shit doesn't matter. Uh, there's a quote that goes around on social media pretty regularly. It's like, you think all these things matter until your health is a problem. And then the only thing that matters is getting well. And not everybody realizes that they can get well or has access to the ability, uh, access to people that understand that the body can heal itself if it has the right tools and is able to take out the trash regularly. Take out the trash, meaning you're pooing, you're peeing, you're sweating, you're breathing, you're sleeping. Sleeping is a big, big, big way that our body takes out the trash. So... PCPs getting penalized for positive outcomes from lifestyle changes is just ridiculous. It's unacceptable. It is the middleman stepping in and saying, no, doctor, don't do that. Even though we're saying you should do that, don't do that. You need to make sure these patients are on medications. It really does show that the pharmaceutical industry really has a grip on insurance companies. If you really want to watch something that'll make you mad or read something that'll make you upset, here's my recommendations and I'll drop these in the show notes. The Bleeding Edge, a, a medical device documentary from 2018, talks about a product called Esure. Don't worry, we just shipped it to Africa. All good. We don't have it in the United States anymore, but we shipped it to Africa. Um, two books. And I'll probably talk about these on other podcasts too because they were so impactful in the way I think about our healthcare system. I should call it sick care system because that's really what it is. Uh, the Truth About Drug Companies by, um, oh, I'm seeing her name, Maria uh, Marce Marcia. Uh, ba -ba -ba. She was a medical doctor that was the editor of JAMA. It was written in the early 2000s, still incredibly um, relevant. And then a new book by Dr. John Abramson, a med medical doctor who wrote the book The Sickening. It came out in February of 2022. He was on Joe Rogan's podcast, um, I believe, last February. Um, really good podcast episode. If, again, you want to understand the like sneakiness that goes into medical prescribing, medical research, it was honestly worse than I thought. So those three things I'd recommend uh, is a good starting point to start educating yourself. Um, both, both of the books talk about statins and the statin shenanigans that tends to go around. I have patients come see me with total cholesterol of 226 and oh my god, my doctor told me it's so, so high. I need to be on statins. And they're 32. I'm like, huh? Really? Do you? Let's take a look. Let's pop the hood and look at your NMR lipoprotein fractionation, which is a fancy way of saying we're popping the hood on the old school lipid panel, which is from the 50s, by the way. We've learned a little bit of something, something since, since then. 
So lifestyle changes are incredibly profound. I see them every single day. I discharge patients from my care because they added in the recommendations, the lifestyle recommendations. They built those habits. They built the consistency. That's the important thing. When you're changing habits, consistency, 80-20, 5.6 days a week, you are doing the work, you're putting the effort in. So if that's 20 Let's just say 23 days out of the out of the month, you are doing the things you need to do to take care of yourselves. You are building that habit. You're strengthening that muscle. You're strengthening your focus to be able to say, yep, I'm going to have protein. I'm going to take my walks. I'm going to, you know, just like you took, you take your medication every day. You can take your supplements every day. You can sit and meditate for five freaking minutes. Like you really can do it. So don't call your doctor's providers. I'm not a provider. You can call me, hey, you. You can call me tinfoil hat herb doctor. I don't really care. Just don't call me a provider. Um, I am not going to condone uh, the use of a demeaning word to demean an entire group of human beings. Um, CMS. I am not covered in the state of Colorado to take Medicaid, and we naturopathic doctors are not allowed to take Medicare yet. And as a medical doctor here in Montrose told me, honey, you don't want Medicare. It's like the headaches and the paperwork and like the 2,500 requirements that I am as a professional that would have to take, have to do with my patients. I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do and do it as well as I do if I was then following this rigmarole of the insurance game. Uh, call your doctor talk to them. Let them know you care about them. Let them know that they matter. Being a healthcare professional is challenging in a lot of ways. And could you imagine? I can't imagine being an 18-minute doctor. If 90 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes are my follow-ups. You know, that's that's nice for me. Um, flowchart medicine has its place. It's Those are not my standards of care. Um, they're important for me to know so that I can work with other medical professionals. Um, but that's not the standard I use. I use a much tighter, I want my patients to be healthy. And I know other medical professionals do, but the insurance system sh seems like they don't want you to be healthy. They want you on the medication. They want you having these procedures. Um, and those three resources show that as well. So if you guys have really been enjoying this content, I'd love for you su to subscribe, share this with a friend, you know, talk about this. Like the point of my podcast is to increase accessibility to holistic options, but also to talk about the very real problems with it, with our system of healthcare that we have here in the United States. Um, I don't necessarily think socialized medicine is the way. There's other problems with that too, um, but we need some kind of shifting here. I want you guys to get well. I want you guys to feel like you can advocate for your health care. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to <laughs> stick it to the interns companies, which I know a lot of people don't like to do. Um, so like and subscribe. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. And I will see you next time.